Hello and welcome to part three of Take It, a guide to improvising and soloing on the ukulele. In part one, we looked at the pentatonic scale, the major pentatonic, and how we could use that to play over simple chord sequences where the chords all remained in the key. In the second part, we learned the minor pentatonic, how we could use that as well to play over a three chord major key blues and how the minor pentatonic gave us these notes that well told us we were playing the blues these notes that we think of as blue notes so if you've not done those first two lessons it's now's a great time to go back and go through those because in this lesson we're going to look at what happens when you get a chord or two that is not part of the key. So here's my circle of fifths and on my circle of fifths if you don't know this already if you find a bunch of chords that are all next to each other like C, F, G, A minor, D minor and E minor that little group of three that little kind of slice of our circle there they all belong together in the key of the chord that's in the middle so key of C, C, G, F, D minor, A minor, E minor, all of those chords belong in that key because they're all made from the same notes. All of those chords are made from just the notes of the key of C. You can play all of those notes just on the white notes of a piano. Which means if you're improvising over them, all of those white notes of the piano, all of those notes of C major will work. Now because the C major pentatonic scale is just a small collection of some of those notes from the key of C, of course they'll all work too. But not all songs are diatonic. Not all songs only use chords made from notes in the key. Sometimes, quite often, we have chords that step outside of the key. For example, the song Five Foot Two, which many of us play, has C, but then it has an E7 here and an A7 and a D7. Now none of those are in here. Those three chords have different notes in them. And if we try and improvise over those, just using the notes of, say, our major pentatonic, we're going to find that maybe sometimes we get lucky, but other times we're going to hit some notes that are going to be real clangers. So in this lesson, we're going to look at a technique of finding our way through a chord sequence improvising over the chords and avoiding those horrible notes. Now when your chord progression steps away from the key, we're going to have to stop just playing the same scale, which is what we've been able to do up until now. The problem we're going to have is that if that chord doesn't belong in that key, then it's not going to match up with the scale. So we're going to look today at a way of soloing using chord tones simply the notes that belong in that chord. So rather than thinking about scales, we're thinking about finding notes that work with just that chord when that chord comes along. Now there doesn't have to be a lot or indeed any music theory involved in this. The more positions you know on the neck to play a chord, the more places you'll be able to find the notes that belong in that chord. Now for this lesson, we're going to use a chord progression just eight bars long. It goes like this, C, F, E7, F, D7, G7, C, G7. Now all of the C's, F's and G7's belong in the key of C. Now we could therefore just use the major pentatonic when we're playing over those and mixing up these ideas is something we're going to come back to at the end of this. But two of those chords don't belong. If you haven't spotted them already it's the E7 and the D7. Now when those come along we've got a problem because if I'm playing my major pentatonic for example Those notes work great over the C, the F and the G7. But an E7, if I try and play 
the third fret of my E string, that one's not going to work. I might get away with some of the others. For example, my open second string is fine. My third fret of my A string is a bit unusual, but it's okay in the right context if we phrase it right. The problem is, unless you really know what's coming up in the next chord, it's going to be pot luck whether you hit the right one. Unless we think of it like this. There's a very strong relationship. In fact, it's not even a relationship. It's just two ways of talking of the same thing. If we play that E7 chord, we are playing the notes of E, G sharp, B and D. Now, don't worry about theory because we're not going to do any more about that. But the point is that because I know the four notes in that chord, I know that if I play a melody with one of those notes, it will fit. Of course it will fit. It's already there. Melody often uses notes that are already hiding in the chord. Now, without knowing those notes, I can still look at my fretboard and go, I can play any of the notes I'm holding down or any of the open strings that are in that chord when that chord comes along. So, for example, when we're playing through our pattern, I can play along and when I get to my E7 chord, I could play the second fret of my A string because it's right there in the chord. I could play my open E string, I could play the second fret on my C string, or I could play the first fret on my G string, because all of those notes, not only will they work, they'll sound great, because they are fundamental to that chord. They're going to sound like strong notes. The same thing applies with my D7 chord. If I play the D7 as a bar at the second fret, and my second finger on the third fret of the first string, I can play any of those notes. I can play the second fret, the G, C and E strings, and I can play the third fret on the A string. But if you also know a D7 played like this, you'll see that I could also play the open C string and the open A string, because they're in that version of a D7. And this is where the magic lies. The more chord inversions you know, in other words, the more places you can play the same chord around the neck, the more options you'll have for notes. So I had two different D7s there, and when I went to the second shape, it gave me a couple more options. So let's have a look at some that you might know already, but if you don't know any of these or you want to learn more, have a look at this little video, the little link's gonna pop up there, which will help you find your way around the fingerboard using just a small number of shapes. E7, the first chord we come to that's a problem. If I know that E7, I've got four different places I know I can play. But if I also know that there's an E7 where I bar the fourth fret and play the fifth fret of the A string, now I've got those notes. And if I also know I can bar the seventh fret and put my second finger on the eighth fret of the C string, I can play those notes. Now, probably more useful if I'm soloing might be to just look at what's happening on the top two strings. I don't really want to be leaping around across strings too much if I'm trying to play a nice flowing solo. So when it comes to the E7, on my top string, I can play the second fret. I can also play the fifth fret. And I can play the seventh fret. Now, if I've only got one bar of a chord, I'm not going to need that many. All of those notes will work over the E7 chord, just because I knew three E7s. Let's find a few for the D7 as well, and then we'll put the backing track on, and I'll play with a few ideas. So we know we've got our open D7 and our barred D7 at the second fret, but there's also a D7, which is a bar at the fifth fret, and your second finger on the C string, sixth fret. Now again, don't worry about all of those necessarily, just look at what's happening on the top two strings. Or even just the top string. I can play the fifth fret, I can play the third fret, 
and I can play it open. And all of those notes fit in to one of those D7 chords. I could also play on the second string using those same shapes. So I could play the fifth fret on my E string because it's part of this D7. And I could play the second fret on my E string because that's part of both this D7 and this D7. So I've only got two options there, but I've now got those notes just derived from those chord shapes. Let's put a backing track on now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play those same chords C, F, E7, F, D7, G7, C and G7 but I'm only going to play notes that belong in those chords. And I'm going to find those notes by just using chord inversions. Okay, it wasn't the most exciting solo and I was having to be quite careful myself because musically I was feeling I wanted to play something but I was having to hold back and go no 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 you've got to play what's in the chord but let me just give you some examples of what I did I played now those three notes all belong in a C chord so let me show you some of the ideas of things that I might have just done on a C chord, I could play any of the notes in this C chord. So Now I might have played them in, in different places on the neck, but they're still within a chord shape that I recognize as a C. On the F chord, I'm also going to be picking out notes that belong in an F chord, maybe. There's my F chord. On my E7 chord, and then back to my F again. And then I could go for my D7 chord. I could actually play. Or. And then I could go down to open shapes. Or I could go further up the neck as I did later on. And play my 7th fret on the C chord. Because it's part of a, a C chord up here. And one fret higher than that is part of a G7 chord there. So sometimes it seemed like I wasn't moving notes and that's because there's overlap. So the perfect bit of overlap here is if I'm playing that F chord, I could either play the third fret or the open string on the top of that F chord because with our F chord, we can either play a two finger F, two open, one open, or we can play a three finger F with the third fret of the first string on there, two open, one, three. Those two notes are also the top notes of our two finger open D7 and our barred D7. And this is a clever thing we can do when we're soloing. I've got two chords in a row there, F and D7, where I can play. So I can have F, D7. And that's a nice little thing because the melody repeats and it's a nice little hook but it sounds different because the chord underneath it has changed, but all the notes work. Now I was able to go further up the neck because I knew different chord inversions for Fs and Cs and G7s all over the neck, but you can do it with just one or two to begin with. And as you learn more chord inversions, you'll also open up new avenues for soloing. Okay, so what if you're doing that and you're thinking, I just want something a little bit more. What else can I do? Well, plain old chord tone soloing can be a little bit dull, particularly if you've got a fairly simple chord progression. But there are two things we can do to jazz it up a little bit. The first one is what we call chromatic approaches. And the second one is chord extensions or colour notes.
Don't panic, they're both quite easy concepts. First of all, chromatic approaches. Chromatic notes are all of the notes. So the chromatic scale is we play every single note. Okay, so a chromatic approach is when we play a note that is just one fret below or above the note we actually want and then move to the one that we were targeting. What do I mean by that? Well, instead of playing this for a C chord, I could maybe start on a note that's one fret below one of those. Now that first note is not the right note to play with a C chord. It doesn't belong in a C, but it's one fret below one that does. So as long as I move from that to the right one, it'll sound great. And already that's starting to sound like a melody line, an interesting solo that's leading me somewhere. But all I did was play chord tones of the first three chords and add a note that was one fret above or below the note I actually wanted to hit. So that's quite a simple one. It sounds hard, chromatic approach, but it just means find a note that's a wrong note that's one fret away from a note that's the right note and move from the wrong one to the right one. You'll find that sometimes it'll be more effective than other times, but you'll start to get a feel for doing it. The other thing I said was extension notes or, or colour tones. And that's where the soloist plays a note that isn't in the chord, but could be. It's a little bit of a harder concept to get. It almost nearly always happens on seventh chords or sometimes on, on minor seventh chords. What I mean by that is, say the chord is D7, it could be a D9 because a ninth chord is just a seventh chord with a bit more interest and colour to it. So even though the chord that's called for is a D7, if I play the note that belongs in a D9, the one that makes that a D9, which would be the fourth fret of my C string, or the open E string, same note, that note will turn this D7 into a D9. And so that means your line is actually adding to the chord sequence. And again, you don't have to overcomplicate this. Do it when you know a shape for that chord and pick a note from that shape. So our E7, one, two, open two. At E9, one, two, two, two. It just means that I have one extra note I can choose over that E7, which is this second fret of my E string. And it will turn that chord into an E9. Now that's not wrong, it just means you're adding more interest and colour to the harmony, even though the person playing the chord isn't actually playing that chord. Now, of course, just as in the first couple of lessons, we learned two scales and in the second lesson, we figured out we could mix those scales and play the C major pentatonic sometimes and the C minor pentatonic when we wanted a bluesier sound. We've now got a third thing we can throw into the mix, which is chord tone. Now, we don't have to just use the chord tones on the chords that fall outside of the key, but we could. We could play pentatonics on every chord in this except for the E7 and the D7, which is what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to play, I'm going to stick to a major pentatonic all the way through except on those two rogue chords where I'm going to play just the notes that belong in those chords. And then I'll let the backing track play on and you can have a play around playing with whatever you want to do. You can try and do what I just did or you can just practice chord tones. <laughs> 
pentatonic scales for your diatonic chords, chord tones for those chords that don't fit in, and of course chord tones for your diatonic chords as well if you want to. You've got a really powerful set of tools and you haven't had to learn specific things beyond those two first scales because everything else is tied in to chord shapes that you already know. So the more chord shapes you can play around the neck and the more those chord shapes can be extended to ninths and thirteenths and things like that, the more options you'll have for notes to play. So the final thing really, before I put on a long backing track for you to noodle away to your heart's content, is to think about what we're trying to say in our solo. Are we just trying to do what I've been doing in the examples, which is really just try and piece together some notes and focus very carefully, as I was trying to do, on just playing the things that I told you I was going to play? Or do we want to start thinking about making musical statements? When you're soloing, and I mentioned this before, particularly in the blues in a previous lesson, you're going to want to think about short phrases that make sense, maybe that feel like a question and an answer or an echo. And that's a really good way to think about your soloing. Also, think about solos that you could hum. And when we sing, we don't just sing like this. La 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 we have to breathe. So when we sing, we phrase our singing. When we speak, we phrase what we say, not only to make sense, but so that we can take a breath in between phrases. And that way, people can take little bite-sized bits of what we say while we naturally pause and understand them. The best way to get better at soloing is to just do lots and lots of it. But don't do it mindlessly. Do it when you think to yourself, OK, I'm going to solo using the major pentatonic. I'm going to solo using the minor pentatonic because I want this sound. I'm going to solo using chord tones either because I want a different sound or because I know that that chord is going to clash with my pentatonic scale because it doesn't belong in the key. I'll pop the backing track on now and you've got a nice long run out for you to be able to play whatever you want to and experiment. And I hope you'll come back and keep using the backing track to have a play. I hope you've enjoyed this and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.